Welcome to the fifth annual Bill Fagey Global Health Awards. This monumental evening recognizes individuals and organizations that have made substantial contributions to global health. Global health is a timely topic now more than ever due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We would not be here tonight without the tireless work Bill Nordmark has put in this year. Bill has served as the event chair for the Bill Fagey Global Health Awards and helped lead the way for fundraising and navigating how the event will run due to the constantly changing information coming from the pandemic. I'm honored to share these compelling stories with all of you here tonight, starting with Steve Sterling. Born in South Korea, Steve contracted polio as a young child. His parents could no longer care for him, so he and his sister were sent to an orphanage. Fortunately, they were both adopted by a family from Alaska. Today, Steve is president and CEO of MAP International. MAP's mission is saving millions of lives by supplying vital medicines to impoverished countries across the globe. Please join me in welcoming Steve Sterling. Good evening. What an honor and privilege it is to be acknowledging, recognizing, and appreciating true global humanitarians for their work and contributions in their area of global health. Dr. Anthony Fauci, Dr. Carlos Del Rio, Dr. Catalin Carrico, and the frontline healthcare workers who bravely protected us against the coronavirus. I'm humbled to be in your virtual presence as we present the 2021 Bill Figure Global Health Awards. Thank you to each of you for taking time to join us for this evening's special event. I would like to give a special thanks to our honorary co-chairs, Carol Tomei and Ed Bastian. Although we are unable to gather in person tonight, we are grateful for your ongoing support of this event and our work in global health. I would also like to thank Bill Normark, the chair of the event host committee and the host committee members Finally, I'd like to thank Natalie Allen for being our MC for this evening's event. We have been through an unprecedented and difficult time over the past 18 months as we battled against an unseen enemy, the coronavirus. In memory of the hundreds of thousands of people in the US and millions around the world who have lost their lives to COVID-19, please join me for this moment of silence in honoring their memory of lives lost. Now, I'd like to invite Natalie Allen to take us through this evening's program. Thank you, Steve. It is more important than ever to help MAP International with their global health goal due to the pandemic. The Bill Feige Global Health Awards have honored many global health icons. Past winners include the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Rotary International for their work in eradicating polio. This year's honorary co-chairs are Carol Tomei, CEO of UPS, and Ed Bastian, CEO of Delta Airlines. This year's Bill Fagey Global Health Award recipients are Dr. Anthony Fauci, Dr. Carlos Del Rio, Dr. Catalin Carrico, and our frontline healthcare workers for fighting against the COVID-19 pandemic, putting our lives and safety above their own. Tonight, the Metro Atlanta Chamber will also give its annual Heroes of Global Health Awards to two worthy recipients. The primary award tonight is named for Dr. Bill Fagey, an icon in global health. Science.com credits Dr. Fagey with saving more lives than anyone in history, having devised the programs that eradicated the only major disease that has ever been eliminated from the earth smallpox, and now the soon-to-be-achieved program to end polio. Without further ado, let's start the evening off with a video on the pioneer of global health, someone who inspires us all. He is one of the reasons we are all here tonight, Dr. Bill Fagey. My wife and I lived in an African village with a three-year-old son and 
over time, I was impressed that there were two things different between the health that the village children could expect and the health that our son could expect. We had knowledge of which organisms were causing problems, how they spread, how you could prevent them. The second thing is we did not have to live on a dollar a day. Poverty is the single biggest cause of poor health, the single biggest cause. What really inspired me was the way this gentle giant could help people congeal together. He'll lift your eyes up to look to the far vision of what we should be doing and where we should be going. Not many people have that magic. Bill Fagan is a mentor, he's a guide. Things that can seem impossible are actually possible. Even those things like overcoming poverty that we believe simply will always be with us. The effort that he led to rid the world of smallpox was phenomenal. His work over the years, bringing science and putting it to work in communities around the world, having the ability to generate trust, to explain in understandable terms what it is you're trying to do. He emerged as a scientific and inspirational leader at CDC. One of the original people to make us realize how small the world we live in uh, compared to the types of distances sometimes other people will artificially create. When uh, Dr. Fagy was the commencement speaker at Emory, he talked a lot about home and what home is. And he made it quite clear that home is not the place where you're from. Home is where you're needed. One of the challenges was how do we come up with a award that is worthy of the global health footprint? And we thought through it, and Bill Fahey has done more for global health than anyone in the world. I think it's wonderful that MAP International is awarding something in Bill's honor because of what both of them represent. Each one of us is capable of enormous good, and nobody demonstrates that more effectively or with more impact than Bill Fahey. We cannot begin to thank Bill Fagy enough for all of his hard work. MAP International could not have picked a better namesake for this event. In case anyone is not familiar with MAP International, let's take an inside look at the hard work MAP International does year-round to provide medicine and healthcare supplies to those in need around the world. MAP is a global health organization. Our goal is to provide the medicines and health supplies to those who don't have them so they can live a life they otherwise might not be able to live. MAP exists to provide life-saving medicines to people around the world. We help all people, regardless of gender, ethnicity, or religious beliefs. We have partners across the world in almost 100 countries that are able to get boots on the ground faster than many other organizations. And so we have a great opportunity to make sure that medications get to ports and get out to clinics and villages that are difficult to reach. Access to a healthcare should not be based on where you're born, who your parents are. We should have access to just basic fundamental healthcare. Everyone deserves to have a healthy life. So this is why I'm so passionate about the work of MAP. And I invite people to join us because with a little bit of help, we can help many, many people. The coronavirus is negatively impacting global health as more people than ever are contracting the disease. Also, more than two billion people around the world don't have access to basic life-saving medicines such as antibiotics and medication for hypertension and diabetes. If you are moved by what you hear tonight, please consider donating by visiting MAP International's website, map.org. For every dollar that you contribute, you enable MAP International to provide more than $105 in donated medicines and health supplies to those in need. MAP International delivers over $660 million in medicines around the world to disasters and impoverished areas. 
This year, MAP has provided help to people hit by the pandemic, people affected by Hurricane Ida, people suffering from the earthquake that hit Haiti, and many other natural disasters. MAP has been providing critical medical aid and health supplies worldwide for 67 years and served millions of people in 86 countries. Please donate tonight so MAP can affect even more lives. We are also here to celebrate the unique status of Atlanta as the center of global health. We are home to the CDC, Task Force for Global Health, American Cancer Society, CARE, MedShare, and many other world-leading public health organizations, including the beneficiary tonight, MAP International, which distributes millions of dollars in direly needed medicines worldwide each year. The Task Force for Global Health, the second largest charity in the U.S., is based here, and the Shepherd Center is renowned as the finest in spinal cord and brain trauma treatment. And for those who do not know, Atlanta has more children's hospital beds than any other city, making us the destination for children with acute diseases from around the world. The list is long and impressive. We will leave tonight knowing more about our city and its special role in the world. Please join me in watching a short film outlining this remarkable story about Atlanta. There are two billion people in the world. That's one quarter of the world population. They do not have access to life-saving medicines. The number one killer of babies under the age of five is diarrhea and upper respiratory infection. Just think about that. If you work in public health, it's not a shocker to realize that there are people dying every day where that death could have been prevented. There are many problems in this world that we can actually solve, and in doing so, help them extract themselves from cycles of poverty. It's something that the richest country on earth, I think, should be involved in doing. In the globalized world, the risk of a pandemic is far greater than it was when Typhoid Mary arrived on a ship. When an epidemic hits, it doesn't respect borders. It doesn't look for visas, it goes across. There are a few places in the world that truly bring together a large group of people interested in global health. Atlanta is one of them. The Atlanta metropolitan area is increasingly important in addressing all of these conditions that are important not only to us in the United States, but important to people around the globe. And we reach around the world. Atlanta is the center of global health because it has a number of organizations, all of a size, to collaborate together to make an impact. All of these different NGOs fit a certain facet of the global health problem. They see a need and they respond to that need. The capacity we have to deploy people, supplies, medications, support structures that are needed. We operate the largest hub in the world here in Atlanta and the opportunities that we have to save lives and eradicate some of the most serious diseases this world knows is part of our mission here in this community. I can't think of another city in the world that has as many supremely successful organizations working in the field. To have these systems and organizations and this ecosystem working together, that's where the magic really happens. You first of all start with lives saved, and then you think about the lives that have been changed. Imagine the family members that have been impacted and affected. I happen to think it's a basic human right. Um, uh, and why is it a right? It's right because it's possible. I'm so excited that MAP is bringing all this together the key role in recognizing one of the world leaders in global health, how MAP approaches at work, how you're really grounded in faith, and, and faith in this case is extremely important. There are many, many more opportunities as we all become more aware of the presence of global health organizations here.
It's incredible to live in a city that contributes so much to the global community through the health initiatives of the various organizations that call Atlanta home. Now it's time to introduce our first award recipient, a woman who was incremental to the development of the COVID-19 vaccine. Dr. Catalin Kiriko is a Hungarian biochemist who specializes in RNA-mediated mechanisms. She is currently the Senior Vice President at BioNTech RNA Pharmaceuticals. Dr. Kiriko's research was fundamental in the development of mRNA for protein therapies and was used within Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Catalin Carico. Dr. Carico grew up in Hungary and she became interested in science at a very early age. She became very fixated on using messenger RNA for both the treatment and for prevention of diseases. If you can imagine the kind of hardship she's had over the years, not getting grant requests, being demoted, being unable to keep a financial support, and all the time continuing to work day and night. As a basic scientist, you are working and you never see what you have spent your life, that whether it is somebody benefit from it. Most of the time, you know, you don't see maybe, you know, 100 years from now, somebody will be helped. She didn't know she was on a time schedule, that coronavirus was going to come along and her years of work had to culminate in something at that point. She didn't know that, but she still worked day and night. You couldn't stop her. So when the coronavirus pandemic finally came, she was ready. And when the vaccine turned out to be protective, she was gratified, but she wasn't surprised. And that's how much she knew about what she was doing. It reminded me of Einstein when one of his theories many years later was validated. When he was interviewed, he said, no, he wasn't surprised. She followed the science, followed her passion, and she's developed this amazing uh, technology of mRNA vaccines that are now have been critical in having the vaccines for COVID. It's an example of somebody who persisted and followed her passion and did not give up when doors were being closed on her. I was just so lucky that uh, I worked on this field for maybe day one and seeing that mRNA was so beneficial for so many has just uh, delayed it, and I never expected that. When I think about that, uh, how many people's lives were saved by this vaccine, I think about all of my colleagues, those who came before us, and I rely on their result, and all of those colleagues I work together, not just at the University of Pennsylvania here at BioNTech, all of those scientists and all of the experts. That's how I feel, that uh, being happy that I was part of the team. I am humbled and honored to receive the Bill Feige Award. And I am also very humbled by learning all of my fellow awardees. And uh, I am very proud of them, their work, and, uh, and I am greatly appreciate. Thank you very much. Dr. Carlos Del Rio is a distinguished professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Emory University School of Medicine and the Executive Associate Dean for Emory at Grady Health System. During the pandemic, Dr. Del Rio worked as a doctor and researcher at Grady Memorial Hospital, treating patients and performing vaccine research. On top of that, he served as an infectious disease expert to numerous media outlets and advise municipal, state, and national leaders on COVID-19 updates and protocols. Dr. Del Rio currently serves the Atlanta community as a member of the Atlanta Mayor's Advisory Council. He's an important and ongoing public voice communicating and informing the public about the pandemic. Please enjoy this video highlighting Dr. Carlos Del Rio. Carlos Del Rio 
he's got some very special qualities. He's somebody who can take on multiple jobs and he never seems to tire himself. He cares for the people who work with him, like his mentees. He's always there. He used to be head of global health at the Rollins School of Public Health, then moved over to the medical school. So he covers quite a swath when it comes to both public health and clinical medicine. He knows every aspect of what's happening with the vaccines and what's happening with the variants of the virus. And on top of this, he gives countless interviews. He's a very globally minded person but understands domestic health. He also understands the connections between the various diseases and of course social factors. He is able to interpret all cultures in a way in which it brings people together. Within countries or between countries, the disparities play a major role. When you look at the impact of the COVID epidemic, both in terms of its transmissibility and in terms of its complications, people living in underserved communities are the most affected. So we can't ignore them. This has become extremely obvious during the COVID pandemic. We owe a lot to him. Carlos, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, congratulate you for winning the Bill Fagi Global Health Award. I couldn't think of a better person to win this award. Carlos, thank you for honoring us by accepting this award. I want to thank the organizers of this event for honoring me uh, in this uh, Bill Feige Global Health Awards night. Uh, I have enormous uh, admiration and respect for Dr. Feige and I'm humbled to have, uh, uh, have an award uh, that includes his name. It's an incredible recognition for my work in global health, but also uh, a, a recognition for the, world, for the work that everybody at Emory University has done in global health. Dr. Anthony Fauci has served as director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the U.S. National Institute of Health since 1984. He has also advised seven U.S. presidents on domestic and global health issues and has a demonstrated history of exceptional work combating infectious diseases including HIV, Ebola, and Zika. Before his work on COVID-19, Dr. Fauci launched the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which the National Institute of Health credits with saving millions of lives in the developing world. Most recently, during COVID-19, Dr. Fauci appeared in televised presidential briefings on the coronavirus. Congratulations, Dr. Fauci, on your award. While the vaccine is a clear miracle, there's another miracle. Dr. Fauci has been the director of the National Institute of Allergy, Immunology and Infectious Disease for over 40 years. To me, it's just remarkable that somebody who at 80 years old has the stamina, the energy, and just the intellectual freshness and capability to do what he does and continue to do what he does. And I think about the early years of HIV, how he went from being attacked by the community to now being the hero of the community. What he's done in HIV, how he's transformed, having PEPFAR, having the research where we are right now. He always has time to talk to you, even though he could be the busiest person on earth. He is incredibly gracious with his time, incredibly gracious with his knowledge. Is somebody who has served the nation like nobody else has. He's provided a national voice on telling the truth. And he was able to do this even at press conferences where there are other people not telling the truth. And he would simply go up and he wouldn't criticize them. He just would tell the truth. He's been able to change the message as the science changes. And so he's not embarrassed about the fact that we only know what we know at a point. We make the best judgments we can. We try to make adequate judgments with inadequate information. And as we get more information, then we change those judgments. He's been willing to do that. Tony, uh, thanks so much. I have known you for so many years, and I knew that this is the way you would respond to this crisis, but I'm so happy to see it. Thank you. 
So just like there's a Bill Fagy Award in global health, maybe in the future there'll be a you know, Tony Fauci Award in, in public health because he also deserves an award in his name. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Natalie, and good evening and warm greetings to you all. I am delighted to be one of this year's honorees, and with gratitude I accept the 2021 Bill Fagy Global Health Award. My sincere thanks to Bill Fagy, my esteemed colleague and friend, and to MAP International for selecting me. It is truly humbling to be in the company of previous recipients, President Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter. I also want to congratulate my fellow awardees, my colleague and friend, Dr. Carlos Del Rio, COVID-19 vaccine pioneer, Dr. Catalin Carrico, and importantly to people across America, the frontline healthcare workers who have been the heart and soul of the public health response throughout this grueling COVID-19 pandemic, and who so deserve our immense gratitude and praise. As you well know, Atlanta has become a leading global health hub. Besides being the headquarters of MAP International and other important nonprofits with global perspectives, such as the Carter Center and Care International, it is home to the federal disease trackers at the CDC and to renowned experts at Emory University and its hospital, who provide some of the best training in the world for a variety of global health professions. As has been said many times and is true, viruses know no borders. A global pandemic requires a global response and in this regard, I applaud the example set by MAP International when it became one of the first nonprofits to respond in early 2020 at the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic with donations of essential supplies for healthcare workers in Wuhan, China, as well as face masks for hospital workers in Georgia and throughout the United States. It is truly an honor to receive the Bill Fagy Global Health Award. Having worked in the public health arena as NIAID director for nearly four decades, it is so clear to me what a towering figure Bill Fagy is. He set an extremely high bar in infectious diseases by helping to lead the successful effort to eradicate smallpox in the late 1970s. Subsequently, his ongoing moral leadership in the global health arena has continued to inspire generations of scientists, physicians, and public health leaders to dedicate their professional lives to being doctors to the world as well. And so thank you again for this wonderful honor. Please stay well and continue your outstanding work. It is my honor to introduce the next portion of our event tonight, a fireside chat with two of the greatest global health icons. I am delighted to turn it over to Dr. Fagy and Dr. Fauci for their insights, followed by Q&A on the pandemic. Good evening, I'm Bill Fagy from Emory University and thanks to all of you for being with us this evening. I'm enormously proud of MAP and the work that they do to improve life around the world. And I'm so pleased that they are tonight honoring people who are defending us against COVID-19. I was struck in the uh, introduction by the debt that we owe to immigrants. Steve Sterling, the CEO of MAP, is an immigrant from Korea. Dr. Carico is an immigrant from Hungary. Dr. Carlos Del Rio is an immigrant from Mexico. And Tony Fauci's grandparents were all born in Italy, so he's an immigrant uh, twice removed, I guess. And then we will hear later on from Dr. Valerie Cantos from 
Ecuador, a frontline worker here in Atlanta. I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Fauci uh, tonight. He may be the best known person in the world at this point. The vaccines are truly a miracle, but I'll tell you one other miracle, and that is while I was channel hopping one night, I saw Dr. Fauci on four different channels, each one saying they were live and that this was an exclusive interview. I don't know how you do that, Tony, but I am now uh, inviting you to a live and exclusive interview. Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Bill. It's really great to be with you as always. Really, really a great pleasure. I'm so pleased. I need to tell you that we have a six-year-old granddaughter in Uruguay. Her parents are teachers. They watch the news, but they say she never watches it. She's always busy drawing something, coloring something, doing something with her toys. And yet one day she saw a picture of the two of us sitting at a table at a panel, her eyes got large and she said to her mother, Papa knows Dr. Fauci. <laughs> and so your fan club <laughs> goes around the world and every age, and they're all asking the same question, and that is, what political position will you run for? Now, before we get into COVID-19, I want to ask you one question. The person that introduced me to MAP International was Surgeon General Coote. You were his personal physician and friend for many years. And for the young people at MAP International, can you say something about Dr. Coop, what kind of a person he was? Well, truly an amazing person, Bill. Uh, an icon in, in multiple fields. He, in many respects, created the field of pediatric surgery. He was an iconic surgery at Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, at the University of Pennsylvania. He did some of the most extraordinary operations, the, the, the famous uh, separation of so-called Siamese twins, uh, a variety of first-time operations on children that had never been done before. He was extraordinary. He cared so much for life, for the lives of individuals. Um, because of that, it was very interesting. He was uh, given the opportunity uh, to become the Surgeon General, mostly because people felt with a conservative administration under the Reagan administration that he would be very much a right to life person, would be against uh, women's uh, uh, desire to, to have choice. And he came down. So he was very much pushed back against by people who were more liberal, thinking that he was a highly conservative person. Well, he wasn't. He was a person that was driven by science. And when he came to Washington, that's when I had the opportunity to become his physician. Uh, it was very interesting, Bill, uh, because he was coming to see me because he was under such stress because they were having hearings blasting him because they didn't want him to be Surgeon General. He came down in a special position of Deputy Assistant Secretary of Health or something like that. And I remember examining him, giving him a full exam and, and realizing that the only thing that was wrong with him is that he had what I call the welcome to Washington syndrome <laughs> and that it was all stress. Once we got past that and he became Surgeon General, he, he fooled people who thought he would be unidimensional in his thoughts, and he wasn't. He was a man of faith. He was conservative. But when it came to the lives of people living with HIV, he was the strongest advocate for HIV prevention, for equity, for lack of stigma, particularly against people whose lives were often under the veil of stigmatism. He was an amazing human being, Bill, a, 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 an iconic surgeon who turned out to be one of the most important public health people who I've met. Just an extraordinary man. We should all use him as a great example. Wow, what a legacy. And I remember those days when even the public health professionals 
were opposed to him being Surgeon General. And I kept saying, what better than a surgeon for Surgeon General? And okay, well, th <laughs> thanks for that. Um, we hear a lot about mutations and variants. And I wonder if you can tell us why do polio and measles vaccine viruses continue to mutate, but they're not a clinical threat? Why, why does some change and some don't? You know, Bill, that is a question. That's a great question. All three are RNA viruses. So if you talk about the lack of proofreading and things like that, you could say, why doesn't polio do that? Why doesn't measles do that? Well, as we know, viruses mutate to adapt. They mutate to be uh, better in their own survival. Polio and measles are optimally adapted viruses, particularly measles, which has a very high r ought and a high, high degree of transmissibility. So when viruses, if you think about, they're mutating to make themselves more adaptable. When you have viruses like polio and measles that were so already adaptable, they're going to get mutations, but they don't need to change much. They're already doing really, really well in transmission. Now, if you look also at the history of viruses, the SARS-CoV-2 is a relatively quite, quite young virus. Polio has been around for about 3,000 years or more. Measles been around for at least 1,000 years and more. So they've had plenty of time to adapt to their best degree of adapting for their own survival. So SARS-CoV-2 is still trying to do that. And that's the reason why it's changing its function. It's becoming more transmissible. It's trying to survive more in the human environment. So I'll go back to what I said to begin with. I don't know the scientifically correct answer to your question, but that's what I think is going on, Bill. Well, I always said with smallpox, we evolved faster than the virus at the end, and that's why we were able to do something. But I've worried about this with polio, that it lingers on so long that it can adapt, and I've always worried about a variant developing there. Another question. Uh, Hospitals take such precautions now with coronavirus. Do we currently have hospital-caused infections of coronavirus either in this country or other countries? We have some in this country because we have the availability of good personal protective equipment or PPE. It is not nearly as much as we've seen in some of the developing countries where they don't have the kind of resources to have equipment for the healthcare providers. But there's no doubt that many healthcare providers have been infected, some seriously, and some have died throughout the world, less so here in the United States. But we still have lost healthcare providers. But the question is always, where did they get infected? Less likely they got infected in the workplace because we have good PPE, but nonetheless, globally, it is a threat to the healthcare profession. Okay, thank you for that. Now, one of the things with measles and polio vaccine that always bothered me, until we got this little decal that we could put on every vial of vaccine, we didn't actually know what that vial of vaccine had been through. And so we would have, quotes breakthrough infections, but we never knew if they were breakthroughs or due to vaccine that it lost its potency. And one of the things I want to pursue now with CDC is could they be doing surveillance that links every, quote, breakthrough case of coronavirus with the lot number of vaccine that they got to see if this is a problem across the board or with certain uh, lots. And so I may be back to you asking for help to pursue that uh, particular question. That's a great question, Bill. Particularly, we need to know because many breakthrough infections are asymptomatic. So you've got to be testing people who are without symptoms who are in contact. That's a very important question. I'd be happy to help in any way I can with that. You've been through so many of the emerging infections, as they're called, and they're usually a new virus that hasn't been seen before 
or one that pops up in unexpected ways. And every time that happens, we find that we're not quite ready in public health. Our infrastructure is not strong enough. Every time it happens, we think this time it'll change everything and the infrastructure will be funded. You now have one foot in public health and one foot in politics, whether you like it or not. And so the question is, how do we make this the tipping point so that coronavirus leads to funding of infrastructure for public health the way we would fund fire stations? Uh, what has to happen and, and what kind of a role could you play in making it happen? Well, I am very much involved, uh, Bill, in what we're talking about as uh, an extended pandemic preparedness plan that involves everything from public health infrastructure, domestically, international collaboration and cooperation, the development of countermeasures in a prototype pathogen manner. That is something that will require sums of money that we have never really put into a uh, lessons learned type of an approach. You know, you've been in it much longer than I have, but in the years that I've been in it, uh, Bill, um, I just, I mean, you've been in it effectively more than I have. <laughs> Maybe not years longer, but effectively more because of your extraordinary historic work with smallpox and other diseases. But the, the impact of this outbreak now, with already 670,000 Americans dead and 4.7 million people dead worldwide, and it is not over yet, I would hope that the corporate memory is very long in its duration. And we should start right now, and we will, putting together a package of literally tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars for preparedness. When you look at what this pandemic has done to the world and to the United States, it's measured in multiple trillions of dollars. So I hope that we don't forget that very soon because we've really got to do that. We do have a plan that, you know, was announced from OSTP of about $65 billion. I do hope we get that. And we do, we are able to build that kind of infrastructure that you're talking about. Well, I'm accustomed to big numbers, as you were referring to my age, but I cannot get my hands around 670,000 deaths. And what this means to 670,000 families and maybe 10 million close associates, I just can't. And so when you bring this up about what needs to happen, one of the questions from the audience is what would you like to see from the private sector? This might be a place where the private sector could actually be helpful. What would you like them to do? You know, I would like the private sector to be very, very cooperative in public-private partnerships, which every time we've seen a public-private partnership that has had success, it has been a booming success. So I would like to see industry who is going to be very much impacted by the next pandemic and this pandemic to really step up to the plate because one looks at what this pandemic has done to the global economy that, you know, if I were not in government, were in industry, I would be striving very hard to be part of the solution to preparing successfully against future outbreaks, as opposed to waiting for something to happen and then asking to be rescued by the federal government. Great response. Now, we talked about all of the new viruses that you've experienced. Uh, in 1976, we had a new human bacterial pathogen, uh, Legionella. And we don't seem to see bacteria turning on us this way. What's your expectation for new bacterial uh, problems? Well, I think we will see them. I believe not as frequently as viruses. You know, viruses have this capability of extraordinary ability 
to mutate even when you don't do something to get them to mutate. Uh, bacteria, you know, people may need to realize, are you talking about, and I know what you mean, Bill, is that we have plenty of a problem that becomes a global problem, not on a brand new bacteria, but on antibiotic resistant bacteria, which is functionally equivalent in some respects to a brand new bacteria. We've seen that with extensively drug resistant tuberculosis, which is almost a different pathogen than plain old MTB. Every once in a while, you get truly a new pathogen, which at least you think it's new because we've never seen it before, when cholera all of a sudden appeared many, many, many years ago. That was almost certainly a new pathogen, but it had to come from somewhere. So it just doesn't buzz, come out of nowhere. So we do get new viruses. Um, I think SARS-CoV-2 is a classic example of that. The pandemic influenzas are classic examples of that. So my short answer to your question is that we can expect that we will see new bacteria. I doubt if it will be as frequent as we see new viruses. You know, you make me wish that I had another 85 years to live in the future and see what's going to happen. A, a two-part question. Uh, you live in two worlds of fighting microorganisms and trying to think like a microorganism. If you were a coronavirus bent on immortality, would you look for a mutation that increases your ability to transmit or to do subclinical infections so you can stay hidden or work on the spike protein? What would you be trying to do as a virus? Yeah, you know, as a virus, I would do clearly the first two things that you say. I would want to be more transmissible. I certainly would not want to kill my host. I would like to be able to have a situation where many people are subclinically uh, infected in the sense that they don't have symptoms. And much of that has to do with mutations that do involve the spike protein, the receptor binding domain, the ability to transmit. And then there are other genes in viruses, as we all well know, that are responsible for their pathogenicity. So I wouldn't want to kill all of my host. That's for sure. One of the things that's so eerily close to the question you asked is something that we just maybe a couple of months into the pandemic realized that fooled us, certainly fooled me, Bill, is the extraordinary high proportion of people who would get infected from an asymptomatic person you know, about 55 to 60%. And to have a pathogen, which is a double jeopardy, and the double jeopardy is what we're leading, leaving with now. So you have a virus that's extraordinarily exquisite in its capabilities of transmitting and also having maybe a third to 40% of the people without symptoms, so it spreads. And yet, that same virus is capable of killing 670,000 Americans. Unless I'm missing something, Bill, I have never seen anything like that, where the same virus can be a wimping virus for someone and a devastating virus for someone else. It's a polymath virus. Yeah. That's what it is. Yes. Okay. Indeed. I said it was a two part question. The second part of this question is, if you were made governor of a state, and I'm just going to choose one at random, Florida. <laughs> random. <laughs> <laughs> what are the next things you would do and in what order? You know, Bill, I, I, would, I would make sure that you, I would put aside any kind of ideological swaying towards public health messages and realize public health by its very nature must be apolitical and non-ideological because there are commonalities in public health. 
that aren't if you're on one side or the other. So the idea about knowing that masks work and that you want to protect everyone, you want to protect teachers, you want to protect the children in school. So the idea of feeling that it's against my personal freedom to, you know, get over that and worry about the people that you're trying to protect. And since governors have a lot of sway to really get out there and encourage people to get vaccinated so that you don't have to mandate vaccines to get people to be in school and in college and in universities and things like that. I would use the bully pulpit of the governorship to focus on one thing like a laser. And that's when you're in the middle of a devastating pandemic, public health rules, not politics. I'll see if I can transmit that to a few states and thank you for that. Now, Tony, I tell public health students, you're not likely to get rich and you're not likely to be thanked, but if you can get beyond those two things, it's a great profession. But now I have to add a third thing. You won't get rich, you won't get thanked, and you might be attacked. How do you interest people into going into this field to follow you when they see this kind of abuse? You know, Bill, I when we went went into public health and medicine, you know, it's to me it, it, it it's an avocation and a calling for something that is for the good of mankind. None of us felt that in trying to save lives and foster the public health domestically and globally, that we would have the kind of opposition and anti-science that we're seeing right now. My, my calling to young people who are thinking of going into this is that the personal rewards of, of, of saving lives and of being part of teams of people, because nobody does it individually. As you mentioned, we're all part of teams that do it, is so gratifying that it really, it, it negates in so many respects the barbs and the attacks. If we don't get our young people to go into this and to make sure that we stay with science and evidence and not conspiracy and fantasy and lack of truth. I believe that we have a responsibility to society to do that. And at the end of the day, the truth and evidence is going to win. I know we're going through a very tough time right now, but I just hope that my younger colleagues who have even the slightest inkling to go into public health, do so. Because if you do have that inkling, there's nothing more gratifying than helping your fellow man. Forget about the fact that we don't get rich. Forget about the fact that we get attacked. It's just such an extraordinary profession and it means so much. Great answer. Uh, I'm worried that one of the wrong conclusions for many people is to keep politicians out of public health. I think quite the contrary, that we are dependent on politicians. We need politicians. And the question is how to get them in early. Is it possible to do Zoom programs, for instance, an hour a week for congressional staff and, and Congress people on public health issues, what's coming down the road, how to get them involved early rather than responding to, to something that's already occurring. Is this even possible? And finally, how do you get public health people to go into politics? Yeah, well, the issue um, of getting po uh, politicians to get in on a Zoom and really understand the public health issues is something that I actually saw several years ago and decades ago, when you had ideological differences, but based fundamentally on a person's interpretation of something instead of a denial of reality of things. Um, I think it's, it was much easier to do, 
I would say 30 years ago, when there was collegiality among the politicians. Right now, the divisiveness that I see is very difficult. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try and do it. I always feel you have to reach out, even when people are attacking you, are doing all the kinds of things that are uncomfortable, you still need to reach out to try and get the truth to them. So I think we should do it to get people on Zooms. I think they would be less interested in doing that than they were 20, 30 years ago, but we still should try. Getting public health people into politics is, is extremely important. We want to make sure that we have within the halls of Congress, within the halls of the Senate, that you have people who understand public health, who care about public health, and don't make their own political ideology sway their interpretation of what is a clear fact, a clear bit of evidence. So both sides, Bill, we need badly. I was director of CDC under both Carter and Reagan. You can't even imagine that happening today. And it's such a discouraging comment. Um, coronaviruses for a long time were just annoying viruses to us. And suddenly they turn vicious. Are there other classes of viruses that are likely to turn on us in ways we don't anticipate? You know, I think that we need to be aware of, of, of many of the different types of viruses that do that. You know, the paramyxoviruses with measles, there are other components of it that could even be worse. I mean, influenza is, to me, the mother of all opportunities where you can have these orthomyxoviruses, which, you know, give you a mild infection, and then all of a sudden they turn on you with a pandemic. We've seen that with coronavirus now, which is really one of the reasons why we are really very serious about the possibility of getting a pan-coronavirus vaccine. Because even among the viruses that generally are not giving you a problem now, if you get them to evolve, and they can evolve by recombinations and things like that, that you've got to be aware. I, I, I can tell you that coronaviruses was never on the radar screen before 2002 when SARS-CoV-1 came. And as long as you have viruses that can adapt themselves in animals and you have the animal-human interface, you can get classes and families of virus that otherwise wouldn't bother you, but when they recombine in an animal and then jump species, you get what we have now with SARS-CoV-2. So I think that's the reason why when you use the prototype pathogen approach, you look at these different families and you find commonalities in them, immune response, ability to respond to a particular imidogen with a vaccine, all of those things we've got to pursue now. We've got to keep the radar screen open, not just for the ones that we know have done it, but the ones that might do it. You bring up a question with, of the last 30 new viruses, uh, three quarters of them have involved an animal or a vector. And yet CDC and WHO don't have integrated surveillance. We do ad hoc surveillance on animals with a particular problem. How can we get that to happen that we truly have integrated human animal surveillance? The, the one uh, approach to both. We've just got to do it. And we've got to do it because of the, of, the, of the data you just gave, which is absolutely correct. That how many times does the animal-human interface have to hit us? Swine flu, H1N1, 2009. The original 1918 flu pandemic. Ebola, HIV, now SARS-CoV-2, and on and on and on. It's just begging for a real fortification and strengthening of that studying of animal-human interface, which you do by surveillance of animals, which is what we really need to do. I totally agree, Bill. I have a final question, but before asking it, uh, one of the listeners 
wants to know what you would recommend to people when they hear so much different information on they should be using this vitamin or that uh, additive, additive to their diet and so forth. Do you have any general information for what people could be doing to improve their own immune status in addition to vaccine? You know, Bill, it, as you well know, if you look at the data on all of these alternative types of approach, um, the data on whether or not that can enhance immunity is really sparse. Um, to strengthen your immune system, the best thing you can do is do some of the healthy things. Rest, exercise, try and diminish stress, have a good diet. I mean, some antioxidants uh, can be helpful, but it's not really strengthening your immune system system. Um, we know that vitamin deficiency sometimes, we know everything, the, the, the eloquent work about, about vitamin A and, and diseases and the, the elegant work on vitamin D with things like tuberculosis and studies like that are all very, very important. But to strengthen an immune system that is already a good immune system, that's tough to do because you don't want to overdrive your immune system. It's for the people who have deficiencies, be they in vitamins, in diet, in other things that can weaken them. That's the thing you want to do. I believe that much more so than claims about herbs and things like that. Well, this has been a great postgraduate course for me and for other people, and I appreciate it. And I have one final question. One of the most discouraging pieces of information that I received recently was that workers in intensive care units are asking that they not put the vaccination status of a patient on the chart. They are so overworked and they say they're worried that they cannot show proper compassion to people that have not been vaccinated. How do you talk to those intensive care workers? You know, those intensive care workers are such heroes and heroines that they don't want to slip when they're so tired and worn out into a situation saying, well, this person was vaccinated and try to do the right thing. This person wasn't, you know, I'm going to take care of the person that behaviorally did the right thing. Uh, they, they don't want to get into that. They don't want to slip into that. You know, I remember when I did my internship and my residency and my chief residency in New York City, um, we were taught right from the beginning, you don't discriminate against somebody in how you feel about caring for them because of their behavior. A typical example, the alcoholic who will come in continually with esophageal bleeding, keeping you up all night, then they come in a week and a half later the same thing. You've got to treat them just like they were the most well-behaved person in the world. That's absolutely essential. The same thing with someone who gets pulled off the street, the famous Bowery bum, as they say, who's there. It doesn't make any difference how they smell or what they do to take care of themselves. They deserve the same care as anybody else that walks into that emergency room or that walks into that intensive care or gets carried into that intensive care unit. Tony, this has been wonderful. Is there something you want to say that I haven't asked that you want to tell the public? Well, I, I want to tell the public, I think one of the things that we've, we've, we've um, sort of discussed in many ways is the, the importance of, of public health and to encourage young people who have even the slightest inkling of doing that. Um, you know, it, it, I, I cannot imagine that you will not feel totally gratified. You know, whether you've done something as extraordinary as you have done, Bill, in the area of smallpox, or whether you're just somebody below the radar screen that's helping people, the gratification is the same. The recognition may be different, but the ratification is really the same. And that there aren't a lot of professions where you can say that. 
when you could walk out at night or go home or wake up in the morning, shave, look yourself in the mirror and you say, I'm doing something that's really helping mankind. So I really encourage young people, don't get discouraged by some of the things that are going on. Just go for it. It's a wonderful profession. Tony, thanks for sharing your time, your knowledge, and your enthusiasm. I appreciate it very much. Natalie, back to you. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be with you as always. Thank you. Thank you to both Dr. Feige and Dr. Fauci for taking time to speak to us on such an important issue as global health. This year, MAP International is honored to present an award to the frontline healthcare workers who have been integral to the global response to COVID-19. Despite all the hardships and risk these healthcare workers have faced, they continue to do their jobs during the pandemic. The frontline healthcare workers have demonstrated courage, compassion, and selflessness during these times. In addition to enduring endless work hours, draining shifts, staff shortages, and deficient supplies, most of these people were isolated from their families, affecting them emotionally and physically, yet they did so without complaint. Accepting the award on behalf of the frontline healthcare workers is Dr. Valeria Cantos Lucio. A strong, healthy country requires a very strong healthcare workforce, great community involvement, and great science. Many healthcare workers during the pandemic, in spite of many challenges and obstacles, were able to somehow overcome it and do their jobs effectively. And for that, we owe them a lot. They have all stretched themselves beyond the call of duty. A number of them, unfortunately, in the early stages of the pandemic got infected. Uh, some of them died. It's not for a day or a week. It's not even for a month that they've been working overtime. A year and a half they've been doing this in order to provide care for us. Even before the vaccine, they were clearly putting their lives on the line by treating people every day with no protection other than the protective clothing. And at the beginning, they had trouble even getting that. At a time of plague, they did not flee, they did not hide, they did not go away. And it's not because they were being paid for it. It's because they really had a mission, had a calling. The pandemic has shown us the importance of gratitude, the importance of thankfulness, the importance of community, and the importance that everybody is connected to everybody else. COVID has been a wake-up call to say, hey, you know, you're not alone in the world. Uh, you know, your borders don't matter. Yes, we are individuals, but we are also an interconnected global and local community. So we have to care for one another, respect one another, and be together. That would be the lesson we need to take forward. It's an honor for me to receive this award on behalf of the million of frontline healthcare workers who have been providing care for patients with COVID and many other illnesses during one of the most devastating pandemics in our generation. We are tired, we are heartbroken, yet we still show up to work, to do what we were born to do, to care for patients, to offer the best services that we can. I admire your resilience, your sensitivity, and your commitment. And I thank you for everything you have done during this difficult time. Thanks. Tonight, we're here to celebrate visionaries in the global health space who deserve recognition for their efforts and contributions throughout this global pandemic. I'm thrilled to celebrate Dr. Anthony Fauci, my good friend, Dr. Carlos Del Rio, and Dr. Caitlin Carrico, for their many milestones and achievements. We also owe gratitude to every single healthcare frontline worker. They are our true heroes, and we cannot say thank you enough to them. Well, I wish we could all be together this evening. It's my honor to recognize and thank our awardees. And on behalf of Delta's 75,000 employees worldwide, congratulations, 
and we offer you our thanks. Frontline healthcare workers are true heroes. Once again, thank you all for your sacrifice in keeping us safe during the COVID-19 pandemic. Ben Harris, the Director of Supply Chain at the Metro Atlanta Chamber, will now present the Heroes of Global Health Awards. Please welcome Ben Harris. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Metro Atlanta Chamber, my name is Ben Harris, and I'm so happy to present the recipients for this year's Heroes of Global Health Awards to Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, President and Dean of Morehouse School of Medicine, and Maria Thacker Gothi, CEO for the Center for Global Health Innovation and the President and CEO of Georgia Bio. The world's leaders in global health call Metro Atlanta home and we are proud to sponsor the Heroes of Global Health Awards. Dr. Montgomery Rice and Maria both embody the hero spirit, opening Atlanta's doors to the global community, leading problem-solving teams in the most challenging global health problems, and displaying the heart and fortitude to serve. Their dedication and leadership advance global health in Atlanta and around the world. Please join me in congratulating them. Thank you for this award. I am truly honored to receive it, especially during a time where so many are deserving. It is an even greater honor to be placed in such distinguished company as those of the past honorees, most of whom have been colleagues at one time or another, and all of whom have made important contributions to improving public health in Georgia and all over the world. A special thanks goes to the Metro Atlanta Chamber, MAP International, and the Bill Fagey Awards Host Committee, and to the sponsors for making this event possible. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted that there are too many communities here and abroad that face severe health inequities because they lack basic access to care. They face systemic social injustices and must contend with rampant misinformation. As the CEO of the Center for Global Health Innovation and president of Georgia Bio, I've made it my life's ambition to address these issues, and I deeply appreciate Dr. Fauci, Dr. Del Rio, Dr. Carrico, Dr. Montgomery Rice, and all the frontline healthcare and service workers for rising to the occasion to combat COVID-19 despite the hardships, health risks, and personal attacks. Finally, I'd like to say that we can beat COVID and we can press forward to shape a healthier, more equitable world by embracing strategic partnerships, medical innovation, global collaboration, and most importantly, by following the science. Thank you again, and please stay well, everyone. Good evening. It is such an honor to receive the Metro Atlanta Chamber Hero of Global Health Award alongside my colleague and friend, Maria Gothi, and to be recognized alongside the Bill Fagey Global Health Award recipients, Dr. Anthony Fauci, Dr. Carlos Del Rio, and Dr. Kate Caracu, and the frontline healthcare workers who have protected us and braved the most difficult part of this global pandemic. The vision of Morehouse School of Medicine is to lead the creation and advancement of health equity, which is why I'm honored to be among tonight's group of honorees, all who are committed to achieving the same mission. Working alongside my local comrades in arms, Carlos and Maria, and more than 30 organizations, Morehouse School of Medicine joined the Global Health Alliance in its efforts to position Atlanta as the international hub for global health, education, and development. In 2018, Morehouse School of Medicine launched our Global Health Equity Office, where we welcomed over 300 participants from five continents to join us in visioning a path towards global health equity. We were honored to have Dr. Fauci serve as our keynote speaker because at Morehouse School of Medicine, we recognize our responsibility to train culturally competent global health professionals. So we strive to assure global learning, research and service opportunities for our faculty, students, and staff. Whether it's AIDS in Ghana, Ebola in Liberia, malaria throughout Africa, hurricane relief and primary health care in Haiti, natural medicine in India and Senegal, public health care policy in South Africa, electronic medical records in Zambia, sickle cell research in Jamaica, 
and of course scientific research in emerging pathogens. And the list goes on and on. Morehouse School of Medicine and our Office of Global Health Equity attempt to meet the needs of our partners throughout the world. Our work is made possible because of the humanitarian work of MAP International and the pioneers such as Dr. Bill Fagan. MAP sets the organizational standard of global health leadership and serves as an example of how organizations can positively change and impact global health. And this evening would not be possible without the true Atlanta and global health leader, Dr. Bill Fagan. Dr. Fagan, you laid the blueprint for global health equity. We thank you and honor you as well for your unwavering dedication and service to advancing health equity. Our world's global health challenges are great and need all of us to step up and do our part. Faced with the pandemic and its negative impacts, the hurricanes, the fires and the floods that we are currently seeing every day on television, it may be easy for us to turn our attention inward but now is not the time to retreat, but to reach out to those who need us most around the world. Indeed, the world is a village, and we are not safe within this pandemic without universal vaccination coverage. We are truly not healthy until poverty and disease are eliminated across the globe. I thank each of tonight's honorees for their work in global health. And I think that Metro Atlanta Chamber, MAP International, and Dr. Bill Fagey for creating spaces and opportunities for individuals and organizations to have impact. Both Morehouse School of Medicine and I will continue to do our part as we work to achieve our mission of global health equity. Thank you. I would like to take some time to thank everyone who made this evening possible. Your continued support has helped further our global health mission. Our event chair, Bill Normark, President and Chief Executive Officer of Avery Incorporated. Honorary co-chairs, Carol Tomei, Chief Executive Officer of UPS. Ed Bastian, Chief Executive Officer of Delta Airlines, and each of our host committee members. Our platinum sponsor, UPS Foundation, Nikki Clifton and Joe Roos. Our gold sponsor, Delta Airlines Inc., Ed Bastian and Ted Hutchison. Thank you to our silver sponsors, World Outreach Fund, Bausch Foundation, Woodruff Health Science Center of Emory University, Good Neighboring Foundation, ShareCare, Aetna, Knox Health, United Healthcare. I would like to thank MAP International Board of Directors, Board Chair Jim Barfoot, Board of Advisors, including Jeff Rosenswag, and all of our special guests for joining us for this special evening. Thanks to each of you for taking time from your busy schedule to join us this evening to honor these humanitarian leaders. Lastly, I would like to thank the following individuals who made this evening possible. Dr. Bill Fege, for whom the Global Health Award is named. Dr. Anthony Fauci, Dr. Carlos Del Rayo, Dr. Kevin Carrico, Frontline Healthcare Workers, Chair of the event, Bill Normark, Natalie Allen, who did an outstanding job emceeing this evening's event. In recognition and appreciation for your contributions, we'd like to present you with a beautiful print by Dr. Hong, a MAP fellow who escaped from North Korea and immigrated to the United States in the 1960s. To share his experience as a MAP fellow many years ago, Dr. Hong would mail sketches and paintings to MAP. With gratitude and appreciation for making this evening possible, we'd like to present each of you with a framed print of one of Dr. Hong's paintings. Please join me in thanking and recognizing each of these wonderful individuals for their contributions. I would like to thank Bob Hope and the Hope Beckham team and the MAP International team as well as David and John Duke of Living Stories. Finally, we are very much looking forward to the Bill Fagey Global Health Awards event in the fall of 2022. God willing, we'll be able to get together in person at the Delta Flight Museum to honor next year's awardees. Thank you so much for attending this evening's event. 
Now I would like to ask Natalie for some final comments. Congratulations to Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice and Maria Thacker and all the other honorees from this evening. We truly hope that all of you have been touched by what you have seen. You can be a part of this vital mission by donating a gift through MAP.org. Please remember that just $1 is equivalent to $105 worth of life-changing medicine and health supplies. Thank you for tuning in to the Bill Feige Global Health Awards. We look forward to celebrating in person with you next year.